Welcome to Lecture 6 of Less Than Nothing. In this episode, we will be diving headfirst into the Hegelian thing in itself. Is it still possible to be Hegelian today? As for the last chapter, where we separate Fichte's choice between parts 1 and 2, we will div be dividing this chapter into parts 1 and 2 as well, in order to make sure that we can start with a clear understanding of where Hegel stands in relation to contemporary philosophy. In this first episode, there will be more of a focus on Hegel's relation to Marx, and in the second episode, there will be more of a focus on Hegel's relation to Deleuze. Thus we officially start with part two, where we have bypassed the first phone call and we have had our first drinks. The road is now going to get much more intense. The quality of the depths we are entering are going to be a transition towards a new level. In order to appreciate this intensity, this quality, this depth, we needed to go over core concepts. We needed to understand Plato for today. We needed to understand Christianity for today. And we needed to understand how we could get to a thing, a fundamental core of reality, that was radically subjective, radically historical, and radically dependent on the existence and the drive. I think that the first lectures, in that case, are a good preparation for the next dive, the next drive. In this next dive, we are going to be asking the core question that will set up the rest of part two. Is it still possible to be Hegelian today? This question is an essential philosophical one. One may assume, especially philosophers today, that Hegel is old news. One may assume, especially philosophers today, that Hegel can be ignored that there is nothing much left in the old idealist metaphysician who took too seriously the human world of knowledge and the archaic understanding of a relation to the absolute, where we are teleologically progressing towards a totalizing grasp of all being. How can we make progress by returning to these notions? Should we not, as Deleuze suggested, just pretend Hegel never existed? Before we start the lecture, I want to quickly let you know how you can support this channel. The first thing you can do is subscribe to the channel and hit the bell for notifications for future videos. Comment and I will try my best to respond. Share or like this video. The support I have received so far has been a great inspiration, so thank you to everyone who's engaged so far. The second thing you can do is revisit the playlist of this series. If you are just starting, it would be best, as always, to start at the beginning so that you can follow the higher level narrative of this lecture series. The third thing you can do is visit my homepage where you will find all of these lectures in blog or transcript form. These may be helpful as guides or references when studying the core content in order to maximize personal understanding. You can also follow this blog by hitting the follow button or entering your email on the right hand side of any given blog article. Fourth, if you really benefit from this lecture series, please consider becoming a Patreon. For as little as $1 a month, you can help me continue to build this channel into a platform for the next generation of philosophy. In the future, I want to cover more of the core books in 21st century philosophy so that we can, together, forge the future of the discipline on the shoulders of the greatest minds cutting into substantial reality. Special thanks to the three people who either became a new Patreon or updated their Patreon pledge, Omar Chavez, Mark Bukharev, and Slavoj Žižek. I have no idea if that is the real Slavoj Žižek who signed up, but that was the name on the Patreon. Now, let's continue with the episode. The first thing to note here is that there are certain points of impossibility in phenomenological historicity, certain points of impossibility that represent irreversible historical events where one cannot simply pretend that a certain thinker or a certain movement did not exist. One cannot simply pretend as if Plato and Aristotle did not construct the foundation of our Western culture. One cannot simply pretend that Spinoza and Descartes did not open up the possibilities of modern spirituality and modern science. One cannot simply pretend that idealist philosophy did not forever challenge our notion of the separation between subject and object. In this same way, for Hegelian philosophers, one cannot simply pretend that the post and the post-post Hegelian philosophers did not happen. They too need to be worked through as formulating knowledge within the cracks and antagonisms and gaps of the post-Hegelian philosophical edifice. However, in the reverse sense, post and post-post-Hegelian philosophers cannot pretend that their work is not directly reactionary 
they cannot pretend that their work is not an attempt to negate Hegel, or in some sense to pretend that Hegel did not exist. That is to pretend that we are not living in a Hegelian shadow, casting a spectral reminder of the absolute. In that sense, when we are asking the question if one can still be Hegelian today, we are not operating on the naive atmosphere of contemporary thought that pretends that one can simply work through philosophy as if Hegel never happened. What happens when we do this? What happens is that Hegel does not disappear, but rather becomes a whole, and a whole in the precise sense of quantum cosmological black holes, where philosophical matter ends up unconsciously circulating around its negative point of reference, the point of reference where space-time itself breaks down, the endless circulation around the irreducible and indestructible point of negativity that continues to haunt us in the 21st century. Thus, when we read of a Marxist straw man of the Hegelian absolute state, or a Kierkegaardian straw man of Hegel's conceptual sublation as an idealization unable to hold repetition, or a Deleuzean straw man of the Hegelian identity as forbidding the possibility of thinking pure difference or otherness, we are dealing with violent simplifications which obfuscate the true dimension of the Hegelian break, the true dimension that requires us to once again work through Hegel. In this episode, we are mostly going to be centering our questions around contemporary Hegelianism within the context of Hegel's relation to Marx. Our contemporary philosophical universe has little problem repeating Marx. Marxist discourse and communist discourse is in many academic universes the dominant discourse. Here we think that Marx was the truth of Hegel. Marx was the one who made Hegel truly revolutionary, as opposed to Hegel's statist reductions, which stripped the proletariat of their true role in the historical process. But is this really the case? Is it that when we move from Hegel to Marx, we get the truth of history? Or is it that Marx, as a reactionary economic activist, misses the philosophical essence of Hegelian negativity? So let us first approach the difference that will be repeatedly analyzed throughout our mediation of the Hegelian thing in itself. The status of the Hegelian straw man versus the status of the Hegelian iron man. The Hegelian straw man, we probably all know from common culture, is presented to us as the caricature of a figure who is an absolute idealist. We get a caricature of a figure who thinks that he possesses the absolute knowledge, that he understands the transcendental structure of totality. In contrast to this figure, we will be deploying a different Hegelian figure, a figure that we may find to be much more robust to post-Hegelian philosophy, and also much more useful for our contemporary philosophical situation in the 21st century. This is a Hegel whose closure of absolute knowledge does not correlate to a total understanding of the transcendental structure of being, but rather a closure forbidding meta-language that opens us up onto the pure speculative dialectical horizon of historical becoming. Thus Hegel is not the character who knows everything, but the caricature who dares us to think the impossible, to think how there is such an emergence of a subject who intervenes into history, whose speculative conjectures or interpretations retroactively transform being itself, to think how the idea or spirit has externalized itself only to return to itself. Here then absolute knowledge is precisely the opposite of what we tend to assume. Absolute knowledge is the knowledge of speculative ideality, that everything hangs on our ability as a limited agent, as an agent who does not know the transcendental structure, to nonetheless participate in this structure of becoming. To quote Zizek, The hole left by this absence of Hegel is then filled with the ridiculous caricature of Hegel, the absolute idealist, who possessed absolute knowledge. The reassertion of Hegel's speculative thought is thus not what it may appear to be, a denial of the post-Hegelian break but rather a bringing forth of that very dimension whose denial sustains the post-Hegelian break itself. In that sense, the Hegelian one is not closed and complete, but always already returning to itself due to a break or a gap or a rupture or a difference internal to itself. For Hegel, the absolute is nothing but what appears in this break or gap or rupture. Here can we not situate post-Hegelian philosophy itself, within the very break or gap or rupture of the symbolic order. The very desire to break away from Hegel, to negate Hegel as the idealist who completes and closes the circle, is a paradoxical confirmation of Hegel's dialectical ideational system, that philosophy itself is doomed, in its immediate repetitions of absolute knowledge, to repeat Hegel over and over. 
For Hegel, the status of the absolute is present every time we step foot within the symbolic order, every time we enunciate, every time we affirm our symbolic identity. We are stepping away from our particular sensual life worlds and into the mediation of the absolute's becoming. If that is really the case, is it even possible to go beyond Hegel, as the post-Hegelian break assumes? Throughout part two of this series, we will see if it is possible to approach that horizon by working not only through Marx, but also Kierkegaard, Nietzsche, Deleuze, Heidegger, and psychoanalysis. What would a truly beyond Hegelian philosophy look like? What would a true negation of Hegel look like? In this quest, let us start from the beginning. Hegel's philosophical edifice rests on the dimension of absolute negativity. In a complete homology with Christianity, Hegel asserts that every form of consciousness can find its truth, not in an immortal and indefinite continuation of its presence in the world, but in its imminent annihilation, in its imminent destruction. There is no such thing as a Hegelian totality that is perfect. There is no such thing as a Hegelian totality that is capable of permanently closing itself and existing as a harmonious one forever. The Hegelian totality is one of absolute negativity, of tension, of antagonism, or, quoting Zizek, Hegel's dialectical methods demonstrates how every fixed determinant shape finds its truth in its annihilation, end quote. This brings us far away from pre-Kantian substantial oneness, forcing us to confront its obverse, the black hole at the heart of human being. Thus, in contrast to Christianity, Hegel does not assert that there exists an other side, a world of full substantial totality where God awaits us, like the light at the end of a tunnel. There is no light at the end of the tunnel, only the absolute pressure of negativity. Or as Zizek stated many times in public lectures, the light at the end of the tunnel is another train speeding towards us to annihilate our being. In that sense, the historical manifestation of self-conscious beings who demand an other side is nothing but the manifestation of a limited finite reality, itself attempting to overcome itself. As we covered in the lecture on Fichte, the other side of an absolute being that would guarantee consciousness in eternity is confusing being with the image. There are thus not two spheres of our secular terrestrial world and a transcendental spiritual world. There is only our secular terrestrial world and its supersensible imagistic becoming against a background of absolute negativity due to fundamental inclusion of subjectivity and its irreducible and inevitable relation to death. This is the Hegelian horizon of speculative historical dialectics. This horizon is a closure onto an opening of pure speculative thought where no meta-language, either naturalist or transcendentalist, allows us to escape our human loop of self-positing. In some sense, we have first received the bad news, but what about the good news? The good news is, for Hegel, that the subject, in its full recognition that the core of its identity lies with negativity, has the knowledge that will allow it to develop its self-universalization. What does this mean? It means that when a subject spontaneously and intuitively rejects its inclusion in the symbolic order, when it refutes the sacrifices it must make in order to participate in the symbolic order, when it attempts to affirm its sensuous pre-symbolic substance, as opposed to cutting into its being with the signifying chain, the subject is here seen as failing to recognize its truth, failing to recognize that the sensuous life world and the pre-symbolic substance is already lost, that the subject is in effect of a signifying chain, that its path towards universality is not found in an idealistic retroactive return to a biological naturalistic life world as what happens in Rousseau, but to give itself to the absence, the gap, the crack in the symbolic edifice to fill in the black hole with its own truth. In that sense, one should not fill in this hole with an image of the other side where everything will be fine and everything will be reconciled. What Hegel would say is that one should renounce all images of the other side and enjoy the cracks, the antagonisms, the fight, the struggle that is necessary for the becoming of the absolute. Or from our lecture on Christianity, where there is nothing, read that I love you. What happens when one does this, as Zizek makes clear, is a subtle parallax shift. What we renounce are pathological particularity. We stop clinging to our finite particularity, and through the work of absolute negativity, we purify ourselves to the level of universality. In the most extreme version of this purification to the level of the universal, one finds oneself working through a battle that is inherent to the becoming of the symbolic order. This is a battle between master and slave, or master and servant. 
This is the battle that constitutes the dialectical machinery of the Hegelian totality. Of course, in order to become in this world, we must in some sense become dialectically in relation to the other. There is always an other, a mother, a father, a teacher, a guide, a boss. Such figures of authority represent limits. They represent obstacles in the way of our true desire to be the unlimited master of our self-conscious domain. But we find this desire thwarted, that our substantive work, the work of our subjective spirit, must be mediated in a realm of other subjective spirits, where all is not structured by truly free spirits, but social deadlocks. In this fight, Hegel's assertion of absolute negativity is, paradoxically, the subject's best friend. Hegel claims that the working through of the master-slave relation with absolute negativity brings the subject to confront and overcome any subordination to a human master, that through this work, the subject comes to find that its true master, its only master, is an inhuman abyss, the human's true master can only be death itself. Or to quote Zizek, the subject should recognize in the external terror in this negativity which constantly threatens to annihilate him the very core of his universal subjectivity. In other words, he should fully identify with it. Freedom is thus not freedom from a master, but the replacement of one master with another. The external master is replaced with an internal one, end quote. When the subject fully accepts its mortality, its finitude, its particularity, it is then, paradoxically, that the subject can rise to the level of the immortal, the infinite, to the universal, only in relation to the fact that there is an unspeakable force, an unspeakable power that is within it, but not it, an inhuman within, the inhumanity of death that emerges with the symbolic order. Quote, Hegel is well aware that there is no other world, in which we will be repaid for our terrestrial losses. Transcendence is absolutely imminent. What is beyond finite reality is nothing but the imminent process of itself overcoming. Hegel's name for this absolute imminence of transcendence is absolute negativity, as he makes clear in an exemplary way in the dialectics of master and servant. The servant's secure particular finite identity is unsettled when, in experiencing the fear of death during his confrontation with the master, he gets a whiff of the infinite power of negativity. Here, a sublime passage from Hegel himself, a passage so important that Zizek can be found to quote it a few times throughout less than nothing. Quote, for this consciousness was not in peril and fear for this element or that, nor for this or that moment of time. It was afraid for its entire being. It felt the fear of death, the sovereign master. It has been in that experience melted to its inmost soul, has trembled throughout its every fiber, and all that was fixed and steadfast has quaked within it. This complete perturbation of its entire substance, this absolute dissolution of all its stability into fluent continuity is, however, the simple ultimate nature of self-consciousness, absolute negativity, pure self-relating existence, which consequently is involved in this type of consciousness. What we get in this quote is an absolutely breathtaking description of what one spirit may feel on confrontation with its own death, or on serious reflection within the abyssal nature of death itself. One here encounters the real other or the real other side. This other side is not the light of an all-knowing and all-loving God, but an absolute erasure of particular identity. One comes to realize that all this time you thought you were in control, all this time you thought you were the master, all this time you had the slice of your world, and you were the king of the world. There was an other as negativity, an other that let you play for a while, that let you sing for a while, that let you breathe for a while. But this is nothing but your finite particular temporality. The Hegelian edifice is thus built on a confrontation with this undeniable fact, this undeniable fact that we humans, no matter how hard we repress it, we are not in control of ourselves. We are at the mercy of the absolute negativity what we have come to call death. Quote, what then does the servant get in exchange for renouncing all the wealth of his particular self? Nothing. In overcoming his particular terrestrial self, the servant does not reach a higher level of spiritual self. All he has to do is to shift his position and recognize in what appears to him as the overwhelming power of destruction which threatens to obliterate his particular identity, the absolute negativity which forms the very core of his own self. In short, the subject has to fully identify with the force that threatens to wipe him out. What he feared in fearing death was the negative power of his own self. End quote. 
All of this is essential for understanding Hegelian self-identity, for understanding Hegelian essence, or the historical phenomenological process of essencing. Hegel's point regarding identity is, as usual, subtle but crucial, which is that the finitude of the self and the self's inconsistency in relation to its desire is fundamental. In that sense, there is no such thing as a self that is independent of the constraints of finitude. There is no such thing as a self that is independent of inconsistent perspectival distortions. In that way, we can see that Hegel turns on its head the straw man of an absolute knowledge where the self is fully transparent, where the self fully knows itself and its world and its complete transcendental structure. In contrast, the self is nothing but its finitude and its inconsistency, and thus absolute knowing is precisely this. Recognizing that one can only fit oneself to the truth of its no notional determinations by accepting existential limitation as existential liberation. From this perspective, one should be quick to note, and one should be reflective enough to meditate on the fact that what the subject projects as its obstacles, what the subject projects as its enemies, like death for example, are in some sense secondary mediations of the self's irreducible finitude and inconsistency. What does this mean? It is essential to know, and especially for today, what it means is that the subject can often be heard to structure its discourse in such a way that it imagines if X obstacle or if, if X enemy was out of the way, if it ceased to be, then I would be free or I would be happy or I would be reconciled with my substance. What the subject fails to recognize is that this is a secondary mediation of a more primary mediation of coming to terms with finitude and inconsistency itself. To quote Zizek, Hegel's point here concerns the primacy of self-contradiction over the external obstacle or enemy. We are not finite and self-consistent because our activity is always thwarted by external obstacles. We are thwarted by external obstacles because we are finite and inconsistent, end quote. In other words, there is no obstacle or enemy that could be removed so that the subject would be reconciled with its true substance or essence. The true substances or essences, the essencing of being, is nothing but its struggle with oppositional determination, with the realm of obstacles and enemies. Now, th with this in mind, one has a precise formula for an ideological subject. An ideological subject is precisely the subject who is not capable of recognizing that its very self-identity hangs on obstacles and enemies. That if one were to remove the obstacle or the enemy in the way, one would simultaneously remove the subject's identity itself. This is not to say that there are not legitimate obstacles and enemies in our way, there are, but rather a reflective shift, to recognize in one's own opposite, one's own most intimate substance. Thus, if one is an unreflective anarchist, it could be that one's own most intimate substance is hierarchical authority. If one is an unreflective Marxist, it could be that one's own most intimate substance is the power that money can bring. If one is an unreflective feminist, it could be that one's own most intimate substance is the masculine gender expression itself, and so forth. In other words, as Zizek claims, often using anti-Semitic references, one's external obstacle tends to be a fetishistic objectivization, end quote. This thought structure brings us to another point which is general, a general tendency in Hegel that refuses any reduction to an idealized harmony. Any reduction to a perfect symmetry or other that would reconcile the absolute. The absolute is radically finitized, radically limited, radically inconsistent. In that sense, when the subject, quite spontaneously, in the mode of the beautiful soul, proposes a totalizing reconciliation, one should be quick and skeptical and critical of such conjectures. One should instead read in this perfect symmetry the obstacles and enemies that the subject has not yet come to recognize as a part of its own substance, its own essence. Furthermore, it is in this sense that one should read the Hegelian truth is the dissolution of all forms of conscious identity, not its full actualization. It is precisely when one can let an obstacle or an enemy go, or precisely when one can see that the obstacle or enemy in the way is something that emerges within that one can achieve a purification to the level of universality. In that sense, could it be that the truth of anarchism would be our coming to terms with hierarchical differences, that the truth of communism would be our coming to terms with inhuman forces of capital, that the truth of feminism would be coming to terms with sexual difference? In what sense would radical egalitarianism in its actuality be a better or even a possible world? Throughout Less Than Nothing, 
we will attempt to approach a new understanding of these dimensions of hierarchy, of capital, and of sexuality. As mentioned, Hegel is a philosopher that carries the wisdom of the cross, the wisdom of the West, the wisdom of Christianity. We can see why Hegel believes that a defeat will bring a subject to confront its truth. This is, after all, the central metaphorical symbolism of Christianity. Thus one does not move from alienation to reconciliation by positing an idealistic absolute substance that would reconcile all opposites and achieve some permanent unity. But rather, one moves from alienation to reconciliation when one comes to see the inherent necessity of antagonisms and contradictions, when one comes to see that the mad dance of the historical play of opposites is fundamental to the historical becoming of the absolute. One does not have historical becoming without oppositional determination. One does not have historical becoming without antagonisms or contradictions. The pages of history in which there are no antagonisms and no contradictions are quite simply not inscribed into the absolute. These harmonious times are non-history within history, not a hole around which everything turns, but simply a lack where nothing is. In order to reflect on this paradox, one can think on the famous science fiction novel Childhood's End by Arthur C. Clarke. In this novel, humans are externally forced into a classical utopian historical mode by alien observers where all antagonisms and contradictions are reconciled. What one should note is that the precise problem for these people was not excessive freedom, but excessive boredom. What would one do independent of antagonisms and contradictions? What would one do if there were no obstacles? This is the very ground of our essencing. From this perspective, Zizek emphasizes that from the standpoint of the absolute, the retroactive insight of reconciliation realizes that there was never really a serious conflict, how the two opposites were always on the same side and necessary for historical being. However, in the same sense, since we are not supporting a disengaged mode of historical subjectivity, the unconscious dimension of reconciliation is a part of reality itself. This means that spirit striving for its self-actualization, for its full immediacy and being, and the resistance of empirical reality, the physical and the social, is a part of reality itself. Consider, for example, transhumanists. Transhumanists are an interesting case of Hegelian subjectivity in the sense that they are waging a battle against nature and death itself, as opposed to anarchists, Marxists, or feminists, who make demands of hierarchy, capital, and patriarchy to fundamentally change the social substance. Transhumanists make demands of nature itself and existential structure itself, with recourse to the big other of scientific discursivity. And it is precisely these modes of subjectivity which are a part of reality, intervening into historical essence. Thus, somehow, we must make sense of this excessive striving for freedom, which is not just a peripheral epiphenomenal activity, but the very central core of reality. From this perspective, it is not that we should move away from our particular human life worlds to understand the universal structure of being. This is a pre-Kantian move. This is a pre-critical move, a move that presents us with a full substantial one independent of a subjective cut. For Hegel, the move to the one is a move that is always already reconstituting and re reconciling itself in the symbolic order. This is the true dimension of the absolute and the true dimension of universality. Thus, one cannot, at least not easily, eliminate this dialectical dimension of spirit striving for freedom. Reality is structured in such a way that the becoming of freedom is a constitutive or perhaps the constitutive element of reality, to quote Zizek. This is what is wrong with the notion of us being imprisoned by the chains of natural determinism. We thereby obfuscate the fact that we are part of reality, that the possible local conflict between our free striving and the external reality that resists it is a conflict inherent to reality itself. That is to say, there is nothing oppressive or constraining about the fact that our innermost strivings are predetermined. When we feel thwarted by our freedom, by the pressure of external reality, there must be something in us some desire or striving, which is thus thwarted. But where do such strivings come from, if not this same reality? Our free will does not in some mysterious way disturb the natural course of things. It is a part and parcel of this course." End quote. In this relation between freedom and nature, the elementary structure of Hegelian subjectivity is one of recognizing the rose in the cross of the present in the sense that one should see in one's problems the elementary level of self-positing, the presuppositions, which upholds the circular motion of the unconscious drive. 
one should see that it is in this way in which one relates to external problems that constitutes reality of the subject. In that sense, subjectivity is finite and contradictory, cannot help but recognize that such a state is the very condition for its existence in the first place, and even the very condition for its essencing, where an alienating labor can paradoxically build the very character of the subject who denounces such labor. However, Hegel does elevate beyond Kant and Fichte in the sense that the horizon of Hegel is not necessarily one simply constituted by the pragmatic ethical struggle with obstacles and enemies. Although Hegel admits the necessity of making this philosophical passage to a philosophy that can handle the limited and local engagement of subjectivity with its practical ethical life world, one cannot simply stop philosophical analysis at this stage. In Hegelian philosophy, we come to think the practical ethical struggle as remaining within the realm of the spurious infinity, of endlessly approaching the impossible goal which can never be. We end up in a universe of endlessly repeating the motion of positing the obstacles and the enemies, and attempting to overcome them in order to reconstitute a new dimension of limitation. In contrast to this view, the Hegelian subject is capable of letting things go, of letting things be, not in the sense of total disengagement with external reality, but with being capable of recognizing its own pathological involvement in generating obstacles and enemies. When the subject is capable of doing this, one becomes directly elevated to the level of symbolic universality, not in the sense of being cleansed of all problems, but in the sense of being cleansed of all particularity. One becomes a direct experiential agent of the absolute, understanding in the flow of becoming one's own necessary essence. Thus, it becomes much easier for an anarchist, a Marxist, or a feminist to see the ways in which they, as self-contradictory and limited subjects, in no way possess the solutions for symbolic universality, that they are as radically decentered vis-a-vis the symbolic order as their oppositional determinations. Let us go further with what a subject must do to elevate itself to the level of symbolic universality, since it is an important message for today. Consider achieving any important task within the symbolic order, like for example producing a PhD, or running for political office, or testing a complex scientific hypothesis, or introducing a new social system organization. One cannot achieve these feats of human self-consciousness if one is infinite and immortal. One must be finite and mortal. One must be limited and contradictory. One must be immersed in its contingent local historical situation as an engaged subjectivity. However, one can still recognize the rose and the cross of the present, and notice that it is not just an endless series of practical ethical obstacles that one must overcome, like doing the necessary research to complete the PhD, or having the necessary populist connections to win an election, or verify a particular set of conjectures experimentally, but instead one is capable of recognizing that in moving with these sets of challenges, of letting the flow of its own set of presuppositions actualize themselves, to actualize and exhaust their potentiality, that one is a part of the universal order of the symbolic. Indeed, without this action, there would be no absolute at all. In short, one is capable of being in the moment, but not a Eastern being in the moment, of constantly meditative reflection, of constantly calling oneself to recognize that it is always now, perhaps by ringing a bell, but instead the much more radical losing oneself in the symbolic, so radically that everything is always now, independent of this reflective recognition of it. Everything is always now because one is in the truth of one's notion. One has been elevated to the highest process of being. In this precise sense, the Hegelian subject is not disengaged or detached from external reality, but has already recognized that the obstacles and enemies in the way of the external goal miss the true point of historical subjectivity. The true point of historical subjectivity, indeed, the subject constituted by the eternal idea or notion, is to enjoy the very rotary motion around the goal, as opposed to directly attempting to achieve the goal itself. This is a central theme that Zizek will continue to emphasize that will be crucial to work towards the deepest interpretation of Hegel possible. Thus one should not detach from external reality, but instead detach from the idea that would close in on itself, that would complete itself in eternity. One here must engage in a parallax shift in regards to eternity, When one is in a mode of completing and closing the infinite goal, one can no longer see the rose and the cross, one can no longer see the beauty of the moment, and one's reality becomes colored only by things in this way, the things that would prevent one a full self-identity, or as Zizek remarks regarding Hegel throughout Less Than Nothing, true evil is found in the perception that sees evil everywhere. 
In this precise sense, the mature Hegelian subject recognizes that the absolute goal is already achieved, the victory is already here, the game is already won, or to quote Zizek, Reconciliation is simultaneously both less and more than the standard idea of overcoming an antagonism, less because nothing really changes, more because the subject of the process is deprived of its very particular substance, end quote. This is so important and subtly different than Eastern spirituality or deconstructionist philosophy would lead us to believe. In Eastern spirituality or deconstructionist philosophy, one would say that the goal of the notion is an illusion, that desire of a notion is a false lure, and that one should either become reclusively internal to a pre-symbolic mental state, or debilitatingly and annoyingly hypercritical of all constructive symbolism. In contrast to either mode, Hegel would emphasize that such modes come to predominate when one is unaware of how to elevate one's subjectivity to the universality of the symbolic order, when one is unable to recognize the necessity of constructive symbolic motion, when one is too fearful to confront being ripped from one's immediate sensual life world and to move in relation to a truth that sublates all particularity in a repetition in and for itself. From Zizek's perspective, this is misunderstanding the core message of the phallic metaphor in regards to true meaning. The phallus can inseminate, the phallus can also urinate. For Eastern spirituality or postmodern deconstruction, the phallus is only an instrument of urination, but only because they do not know how to use the phallus properly for insemination, that one cannot be direct, one must be indirect to inseminate, one must be indirect to be elevated to the heights of the absolute. In other words, if one goes too explicitly and directly to the goal, then one ends up confusing his idea for a naive absolute knowledge, instead of recognizing one's limitations and the rose in the cross of the present. This also leads us to the crucial distinction between Hegel and Marx. As we all know, Marx criticizes philosophy for being too focused on interpretation and not enough focused on transforming or changing the world. For Marx, we may say that he was not a philosopher at all, but an activist. In Marxist theory, we grab the most idealistic image we can, and then we uncritically act in relation to this image as if it were absolute knowledge. We try to endlessly approach the highest social goal possible in a very direct and explicit style, the achievement of world communism. In that sense, for the Marxist, the goal is never realized, the goal is never here, and totalitarianism becomes its dark actuality. In contrast to Marx, Hegel emphasizes how, how one's entire universe can be transformed via a minimal difference, by introducing a new interpretation. Like, for example, when one sees one's own essence in the impossible obstacle of building the communist state, and when one sees one's own essence in the impossible enemy of the bourgeois capitalist, in that sense, Hegel is not against transformation, but rather emphasizes that the transformation one seeks is within, in an interpretational structure or frame that overdetermines the coordinates of one's approach to being itself. This is why in many popular videos, Zizek turns Marx around, asking us once again to think before we act, to interpret before we change. One does not simply act in the world or change in the world, independent of deep reflective thought and interpretation. Quote, Within the finite order, we cannot experience or see that the goal is truly achieved. The accomplishment of the infinite goal resides only in overcoming the illusion that this goal is not yet achieved. The final reversal of the dialectical process is a purely formal turnaround, a shift in perspective. The only thing that changes in the final reconciliation is the subject's standpoint. The subject endorses the loss, reinscribes it as its triumph. Reconciliation is thus simultaneously both less and more than the standard idea of overcoming an antagonism, less because nothing really changes, more because the subject of the process is deprived of its very particular substance." End quote. This brings us very close to understanding Hegel's theory or notion of temporality. In Hegel we do not find a temporality that is structured in our intuitive common sense structure around a past, a present, and a future. In this intuitive common sense structure of temporality, we imagine that we are falling from a perfect unity, that divided into a multiplicity, and that we are now within a problematic multiplicity of phenomena, and that we are heading towards a particular reconciliation with a perfect unity in the future, some telos that would guarantee being. This thought structure is very general, and many different examples can be given of its basic intuitive mechanisms. For example, we find the past-present-future structure of temporality in modern cosmology where we start with the Big Bang, a mysteriously ordered unity or symmetry, 
that broke for some unknown reason and started to differentiate into a multiplicity of phenomena like stars, galaxies, planets, and our local region, life and mind, but also tends towards a central point outside of itself through the power of gravitational attraction like black holes, which are mysterious unities or singularities outside of the geometrical structure of space-time itself. One can also see this structure on existentialist terms. In existentialist terms, we have a memory of a primordial unity of being in the mother's womb, and then we have the division from this unity as we enter the complex world with a multiplicity of phenomena. And then we become future-oriented throughout our biological and cultural and social development towards a horizon where we project dreams of a secular or transcendental nature that can help us to navigate back to a newly constituted unity. Indeed, on existentialist terms, as we will explore later, such a past-present-future structure is the very basic temporal mechanism for many political projects, including foundational theories of communism. However, as mentioned, Hegel's theory of temporality is different than this intuitive structure. For Hegel, we have a time that is all circled or curved up into the present. In that sense, it is not that we have an objective past of what really happened, like the Big Bang or like your birth, but rather a pure virtual past that is being constituted and reconstituted in the present, like we, when we think about the genesis of space-time, or like when we think about the genesis of our experience. Here to quote Zizek, We are thoroughly passive, determined by and dependent on the past, but we have the freedom to define the scope of this determination, to overdetermine the past which will determine us, end quote. And in the same way that we have the power to change the past through reflective mediation in the present, the same goes for the future. It is not that we have some objective future that already exists or is determined from all time in a substantial unity or an eminent necessity, but rather that the future is always something that is constituted in the present by our conceptualizations, by the idea's notional determination, which transforms a contingency to a necessity. We can never forget the way in which our own action, our own intervention into the normal run of things, will transform the future present, like how Marx could never have foreseen how his theories could have transformed the 20th century into a Cold War. This is why Zizek maintains an emphasis throughout Less Than Nothing on a Hegelian absolute that can handle errors and failure, that in order to intervene into the future, one must be fully able to accept that, due to one's limited and finite historical position, one is doomed and destined to make mistakes and errors, but that if one is brave enough to do so, the place and the space for a true decision will emerge the right decision will emerge. If one is constantly waiting for the right time to revolutionize oneself into a perfect being, the time will simply never come. This naturally leads to a different conceptualization of the conflict between the opposites. In our intuitive picture of time, the conflict between the opposites is unreflectively antagonistic, where one side wants to annihilate or eliminate the other. Take, for example, the elementary structure of capitalism versus communism, or conservatism versus liberalism, or atheism versus theology, or evolution versus creationism, or feminism versus the patriarchy, or any other major oppositional determinations. In these struggles, we have oppositional determinations that each feel that they have a different fall and a different return to unity that requires the elimination of the other. In other words, if only the other were removed as an obstacle or enemy, then the true state of being would be imminent. For example, in atheism, we have a purely secular fall and a purely secular future relation to the earth where through science and technology we will be capable of constructing a utopian society in reasonable harmony. However, what stands in the way of this situation are people who believe in theological conceptions of the world, people who believe that our fall is a transcendental fall, and people who believe that our future is a transcendental future, a fall from God and a return to God. In this situation, more theologically inclined people are not aligned with the idea that our past was purely secular, constituted by nature, and not aligned with the idea that our future is purely secular either, and thus cannot participate in the truly secular utopian project committed to the reasonable use of science and technology. However, in Hegelian temporality, where past and future are curved up into the present, the conflict between the opposites are seen to be mutually reinforcing oppositions that require each other for any essential existence. In other words, from the Hegelian point of view, if you remove theology, you would not get a fully unleashed potential of the atheist identity structure capable of ushering in secular utopia and a comprehensive understanding of our natural past. Instead, 
you would get the total dissolution of the atheist identity structure, since its very formation hinges on the negation of theology. In that sense, the atheist and the theological conception of the world become historically constituted phenomenal frames that co-determine each other in opposition at this particular moment of the becoming of speculative conjectures. The same logic can be applied to other oppositional determinations. This means that ultimately, the Hegelian past and the Hegelian future in themselves, that is, outside of the present conflict of the oppositional determination, are nothing but pure virtuality, a pure spectral void of potential. In our intuitive conception of time, we have a past and a future that are fully substantially, fully known. But this conception must fall if both past and future are co-determined in the present. How radical of a notion is this conception of temporality? Is Hegel really saying that there is no literal interpretation of the past as it really was? No. However, for Hegel, this literalness of the past, independent of our present-day presuppositions, is not something known to us or knowable to us, since we are forever caught in the loop of positing the presuppositions. If we were to think that we had a literal understanding of the past and the future, this, for Hegel, would be constituted as a meta-language, which is what precisely is the status of what is an impossibility in Hegelian philosophy. Moreover, what the literal understanding of a noumenal in itself obfuscates is the way in which the past and the future frames for, are for present action. In that sense, we should think of the way in which the past and the future orient our action in the present, and also the way in which we can, in our free action, retroactively transform the way in which we think about the past and the future. In Hegelian time, there is no past or future unity, just their pure spectral virtuality, within a divided unity of the present. In order to demonstrate how these conceptions are synergistic with Deleuzean temporality and psychoanalysis, Zizek quotes Deleuze, who writes, quote, My wound existed before me. I was born to embody it, end quote. This is an intelligent and strategic move by Zizek to make the point that Deleuze's program is synergistic with a Hegelian metaphysics and a Freudian psychoanalysis, where the one is in division, and trauma precedes what the subject believes empirically caused the trauma as an event. Here we have a theory of temporality that in some sense eternalizes the division, eternalizes the trauma, eternalizes the absence or the gap or the whole that simultaneously allows me to be human, all too human. If there were no absence, no gap, or no whole, then the absolute would already be one, and we would not be projecting and reflecting. But since the absolute is divided internal to itself, then the past and the future become subject to retroactivity of positing the presuppositions. We get to pick our trauma, but we do not get to pick trauma itself. In that sense, Deleuze's project of liberating humanity from the human was a task that may once again be a meta-language, a vision of a world where the trauma was not constitutive of being human. This quote captures Zizek's attempt to deploy the temporality of retroactivity of the way in which our past and future are phantasmatically constituted, quote, the retroactivity of a gesture which reconstitutes the past itself. In our ordinary activity, we effectively just follow the virtual phantasmatic coordinates of our identity, while an act proper involves the paradox of an actual move which retroactively changes the very virtual transcendental coordinates of an agent's being, or in Freudian terms, which not only changes the actuality of our world, but also moves its underground. We have thus a kind of reflexive folding back on the condition, onto the given, it was the condition for. While the pure past is the transcendental condition for our acts, our acts not only create new actual reality, but they also retroactively change this very condition." End quote. quote again, the key philosophical implication of Hegelian retroactivity is that it undermines the condition of linear causality where the sum of past causes determines a future event. Retroactivity means that the set of past given reasons is never complete and sufficient, since the past reasons are retroactively activated by what is within the linear order, their effect, end quote. Thus the nature of the idea is to retroactively determine its past, to retroactively determine what was necessary. Let's then apply this logic to Hegel's theory of the state. For Hegel, there is the eternal idea of the state, the perfect state as such, which forms in relation to a historically constituted problem, the problem of historical social organization. As we all know, throughout the historical process, human beings had to struggle with the problems of social organization, 
because our populations expanded from a few hundred individuals in bands and tribes to thousands and eventually hundreds of thousands of individuals. Thus, the idea of the state had to manifest itself in different actual solutions to the same problem. Here, the emphasis is not on the perfect idea, but on the actual manifestation which transforms an ineffective and impotent spectral virtuality into a divided unity that is held together by its historically constituted antagonisms and tensions. In this way, the true revolutionary thought, according to Zizek, is not to think the true manifestation of the ancient republic, as in Plato, or the true manifestation of the modern democracy, as in democratic materialism, but to drop the very actual form of modern democracy and to try to think a new idea that would coordinate a new actual state, which would require a new actual tension or antagonism. The question thus becomes whether or not we can say that modern democracy has exhausted the potential of its idea, whether or not we can say that modern democracy no longer fits the coordinates of the actual struggle between the opposites. Are there cracks in the present that signal that this idea no longer holds together the divided unity? Thus we again here can repeat the same temporal structure applied to the idea of the state. In the top image we may apply this structure to contemporary United States where we have a major conflict between the opposites of left and right. Here the left is an oppositional determination pointing towards a fully substantial future United States and a utopian freedom from any conservatism, and the right is an oppositional determination pointing towards a past fully united United States in a utopian freedom from any progressive liberalism. However, the trick with retroactivity is to read both oppositional determinations not as pointing towards a real past or a real future, but to curve them up into the present between the spectral pure virtual past and a spectral pure virtual future. In that sense, it is the form of the modern democracy itself that is producing this past-future antagonism or tension, and that if we drop the very structure of this idea, both pasts and futures in the popular imaginary would dissolve back into their virtual spectrality. Can we then think an actual higher state? In order to think an actual higher state, we have to think not of a perfect substantial unity that would hold itself together forever. Instead, we have to think about the generative antagonisms and tensions that would hold together an alternative edifice. Or as Zizek states, a problem is thus not only subjective, not just epistemological, a problem for the subject who tries to solve it. It is stricto sensu ontological, inscribed into the thing itself. The structure of reality is problematic, end quote. In that sense, if the virtual problem is of a higher communal or a higher social organization, then we must think what in actuality needs to exist in order for the idea of such an entity to become manifest. The generative power of the idea or the virtual requires the actual, that requires the embodiment of historical subjectivity, requires its sensual reality. Here we apply this to the difference between Marx and Hegel's theory of the state. In Marx, the theory of the state revolves around its material grounding in a literal past and a literal future. Here we know that there was a utopian harmony in our prehistorical order where we did not have to deal with the antagonisms and tensions that structure class relations in history proper. This is prehistorical primitive communism. Furthermore, we know that in the future there will be, from an imminent processing of class struggle, the realization of a utopian post-historical harmony where we are once again freed from class struggle in a communal egalitarian order. Here, we can easily read in this theory the intuitive structure of temporality of the idea, where we have a process of becoming that hangs between the fall from a one and a return to a one, and that it is only a matter of the processing of the temporal opposites for this division to be eternally reconciled. However, in Hegel's theory we cannot be sure of either the hypothesis of harmonious utopian primitive communism or the harmonious utopian future communism. Instead, we have the virtual past, where contemporary subjects organize facts to support their presupposition that prehistory was harmonious and utopian. And we have the unknown virtual future, where contemporary subjects organize their understanding of social logic towards a higher level communal organization. However, in actuality, in our present, what we have is Marxist thought structures at one pole in an antagonistic couple with, al with an alternative capitalist pole, which absolutely negates it. For the capitalist, we are pulling ourselves up, via capital, from a horrible, brutal nature where life was short and difficult, where tribal warfare was common and constitutive of life. For the capitalist, 
It is our contemporary world, inclusive of its class antagonisms, which is the best of all possible universes that we have known. What is the real consequence of processing this antagonism between historically constituted subjectivity? For Hegel, we cannot know this future, and for those who say that we do, we should be here capable of applying our understanding of the structure of Hegelian subjectivity and temporality to understand the elementary nature of ideology. Thus, when Hegel's dialectical development suggests that things become what they are, we are not dealing with an idea or a concept that is already substantially actual as a predetermined necessity, but rather as an idea or a concept that comes to be what it is through the actual work of historical subjectivity. Quote, there is no place in Hegel for the Marxist-Stalinist figure of the communist revolutionary who understands the historical necessity and posits himself as the instrument of its implementation. However, it is crucial to add a further twist here. If we merely assert this impossibility, we are still conceiving the absolute as substance, not as subject. We are still surmising that there is some pre-existing spirit imposing its substantial necessity on history. To be consistently Hegelian, we must take a crucial step further and insist that historical necessity does not pre-exist the contingent process of its actualization, that is, that the historical process is also in itself open, undecided, end quote. Now, let us attempt to formulate a general structure of temporality in the symbolic order in as simplistic a way as possible, or as simple as possible but no simpler. What we are trying to say here about time and history is that we do not simply have an evolutionary historical flow, but an evolutionary historical flow plus an atemporal conceptual structure that holds this historical flow in a virtual retroactive constitution. Here the idea or the concept takes a linear flow and curves it in on itself, attempting to hold all substance in its present. This is what Hegel means when he talks about the absolute as substance but also subject. The subject of the notion holds substance, or attempts to hold substance as a totality. Thus, when Zizek states that a truly new artistic phenomena not only designates a break with the entire past, but retroactively changes this past itself, we should be able to apply the same to political phenomena or sexual phenomena or scientific phenomena. Thus, when the French and Russian Revolution happened, they not only broke with traditional monarchy and capitalism, but they also changed the way in which people view monarchy and capitalism themselves. What this type of thinking calls us to do is to think about the way in which our own notions of history and our own notions of the future are historically constituted in the present by an atemporal idea. The real dimension of Hegelian thought is thus to think this matrix of the atemporal idea itself and the way in which it is moving through all natural and social mediations. This elementary structure of Hegelian totality, of a symbolic order that includes its own past and future, is the difference between what Zizek refers to as the Owl of Minerva and the Gaelic Rooster. Here the Gaelic Rooster stands for French revolutionary thought that believes that it holds the true idea, that believes that it holds the absolute necessity, that believes that it knows the destiny of historical being. In contrast, the Owl of Minerva stands for German contemplative thought, which is aware of the nature of temporal retroactivity, that no subject can embody the idea of the absolute, that no subject has access to the transcendental structure of reality, that there is no science of politics, that there is no way to predict the future of human social organization. In short, the difference between the owl of Minerva and the Gaelic rooster is that the owl, in this case Hegel, quote, leaves reality the way it is, unquote. It does not pretend that it can make reality conform to its ideal notion. This is related to the two different theories on the relation between being and thought and thought and being. In these formulas, we get the elementary distinction between the way in which Marx and Hegel differed in terms of the use and the nature of philosophy itself. For Marx, as already mentioned, philosophy had spent too much time interpreting the world and not enough time changing the world. Thus we may say that Marx conceived of philosophy as something that must become more active, that thought itself must constitute new being, by predicting the future state of affairs. However, Hegel is more conservative, claiming that philosophy is right to place the primacy on the interpretive stance, and to recognize the way in which thought is sublating being retroactively, that there is no need for thought to get caught up in future manipulations of being towards its ideal notion, but rather that thought should attempt to reflect as best as it can the movement of actual being as it unfolds itself. Thus, as Zizek states, quote, Hegel's opening towards the future is a negative. It is articulated in this negative limiting statements 
like the famous one cannot jump ahead of one's time, unquote. Thus, we can say that the difference between Hegel and Marx is the difference between free retroactivity and deterministic teleology. For Hegel, the idea becomes what it becomes, but we can only know this retroactively. We can only know this after the idea has been constituted by our free acts. Whereas for Marx, we know what the idea is becoming and we know how we should actualize it. In that sense, the future is already written and we just need to make it real. The difference that separates Hegel and Marx is the difference that separates the idea of communism from the actuality of communism in the 20th century. For Hegel, as already mentioned, there is no place for the type of deterministic teleology that enabled the existence of totalitarian states in Russia and China. The truth of Marx is that his ideas must be, retroactively, understood as a failure of a particular ideal to impose onto the whole of being its own absolute in an unreflective agent of historical necessity. We should thus consider retroactively, very reflectively, when thinking of mediating future political projects. We should let our thought do its best to interpret and interpret and interpret the structure of our projects as they unfold, with the idea firm in our mind that we do not know the historical necessity. Quote, the impossibility of directly borrowing from the future is grounded in the very fact of retroactivity, which makes the future a priori unpredictable. We cannot climb onto our own shoulders and see ourselves, objectively, in terms of the way we fit into the texture of history, because the texture is again and again retroactively rearranged. And here consider this same logic in the religious context. Quote, in theology, Karl Barth extended this unpredictability to the last judgment itself. God is not hidden from us, he is revealed. But what and how we shall be in Christ, and what and how the world will be in Christ at the end of God's road, at the breaking in and redemption and completion, that is not revealed to us, that is hidden. Let us be honest. We do not know what we are saying when we speak of Jesus Christ's coming again in judgment, and of the resurrection of the dead, of eternal life and eternal death. That with all these there will be bound up a piercing revelation, is too often testified in scripture for us to feel we ought to prepare ourselves for it. For we do not know what we will be revealed when the last covering is removed from our eyes, from all eyes, how we shall behold one another, and what we shall be to one another, upon what divisions and unions, what confrontations and cross-connections the seals of all books will be opened. How much will seem small and unimportant to us then? How much will only then appear great and important? For what surprises of all kinds we must prepare ourselves. We also do not know what nature, as the cosmos in which we have lived and still live here now, will be for us then. What the constellations, the sea, the broad valleys and heights, which we see and know now, will say and mean then. All this does not mean that we should avoid political engagement, since our actions will have unintended and potentially catastrophic consequences, that we cannot know the future. The point is that when one attempts to engage a meaningful project that cuts into history, we should be prepared to end up in places that were unintended. It is in this sense that Hegel was open to the future. The fact that the absolute knowledge and its naive deterministic and teleological sense is closed to us is the very condition for us to engage with an open future. Here God's plan and human freedom coincide. It is the very absence of God, the fact that he turned himself into a particular human to die on the cross, that opens up our freedom. The fact that the absolute knowledge cannot be known, that the background of our historical actions are abyssal, without a big other who would guarantee their success, which makes history worth the experience and the effort. If everything were known, if everything were transparent, then there would be nothing like we know of history. Towards this end, Zizek emphasizes that we must today think the historical constitution of the contemporary constellation of oppositional determination. In our post-Cold War landscape, we have opened ourselves onto an oppositional determination that finds itself structured between formal enlightenment skepticism and fundamental substantial belief in God. Within this constellation, are there the germs of a reconciliation that can think a new social order? For Zizek, the liberal humanist stance emphasizes human rationality and freedom, whereas the traditional fundamentalist emphasizes the raw energy of unconditional commitment and belief. In this synthesis, Zizek suggests that a Christian or a theological materialism would be able to rethink these opposites. The materialist dimension includes a negation of the other, and that there is no substantial transcendental otherness that knows. 
and the Christian or theological dimension includes the unconditional ethical commitment to a better or a higher world. In this synthesis, we can think the actual states that may be necessary, not for world communism, but for a more liberating and free state of actual being. Quote, what would Hegel have made of today's struggle of liberalism against fundamentalist faith? One thing is sure, he would not have simply taken the side of liberalism, but he would have insisted on a mediation of the opposites, end quote. In this episode, we focused on the relation between Hegel and post-Hegelian philosophy, arguing that we need to revive the Iron Man of Hegelian theory as opposed to the straw man character of his thought. We started this project by emphasizing the importance of absolute negativity against the harmonious and perfect view of the absolute. We then applied this theory to the notion of the Hegelian subject and its constitutive relation to historical obstacles and ideals. From this, we attempted to structure the nature of Hegelian temporality under the notion of phenomenal circular retroactivity, as opposed to the common-sense linear conception of time. This notion of time was then applied to our understanding of history and the state formation, and about what we can know about the past and the future in regards to human historical action. Finally, we approached historical destiny and necessity and the way in which we are closed from knowing the truth of the absolute, but open onto a field that requires our thoughtful and reflective action. This brings us to the end of the lecture six on the first lecture of part two, Is It Still Possible to Be Hegelian Today? I hope that this first part of this whirlwind of a chapter has been a good introduction to some very difficult concepts. I feel like it is necessary to understand some of these concepts in detail in order to properly situate the difference between Hegel and some contemporary social theory that is grounded in Marxism and communism. I think that by working through these differences, we can have a higher level understanding of the future of philosophy, and I hope you come back for next week where in part two we will focus more on the relation between Hegel and Deleuze. Before closing, I want to again remind you of all that these episodes have been written transcripts that you can find on my website under the work section. These transcripts should be helpful for study and for following the lectures if you are someone who prefers to read over just listening. Also, I want to thank all of my Patreon supporters for believing in me and for contributing to this channel. It gives me faith that this effort will be successful and that I can continue to build high-level philosophy content for a wide distribution. And special thanks again to my newest supporters, Omar Chavez and Slavoj Žižek. You can also help by subscribing, commenting, sharing, and liking. Any engagement is much appreciated, and I will try to respond to any comments below. Thanks again for watching, and I hope to see you all again next week.